O Heavenly King, the comfort of the Spirit of Truth, who art everywhere present and fillest all things, treasury of good gifts and giver of life, come and abide in us and cleanse us of all impurity, and save our souls, O good one. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to suddenly name this class Where the Rubber Meets the Road. We've learned about true God. We've learned about what is a human being, what was the fall, what is sin, who is Jesus Christ, Son of God, who is Jesus Christ, Savior. So what do we do about it? Well, we're introduced to what we do about it by the term salvation. Last week, we see how Salvation, our salvation from death and annihilation is infinitely varied and great work of Christ. There's lots to what it, what it means, what salvation is. So it's not just one thing. And I, I, I say that to say, well, salvation isn't being forgiven. It isn't any one thing you can put a label on, even though all of those things you might pick uh, participate in it or help um, accomplish it. So not just forgiveness, it also means to be healed of sin or to become more Christ-like or to share in the grace and resurrection life of the church. And I shouldn't be using the word or, and, 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 and. It means to become sons and daughters of the Father. Salvation means to be enlightened as to who we truly are and to God's love and providence and so on. And it goes on and on and on and on, all the descriptors of what salvation means. We do say, though, that salvation comes by Christ alone. And that salvation has those three modes we talked about, which is we have sinned, so therefore we are being saved, or we have been saved, we're being saved, and we will be saved by Jesus and Jesus alone. So one of the first places to look for, okay, where does the rubber meet the road, is right at the beginning of the New Testament. There's introductions in every single book to who is Christ, to the incarnation, because of all things, the scripture is the good news about God's mission to save humanity, his rescue mission. That is what the good news is. Yea, there's a solution for sin and death and annihilation. So we look in the beginning, and what are the first words that of John the Baptist? I'll read from, I think, right after Matthew goes through genealogies and stuff. It says, it starts out this way, the narrative. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And what are, so the first words of John the Baptist, the first thing he utters is repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What are the first words of Jesus? Well, in the first chapter of Mark, in 14 and 15, it says, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, they're describing exactly the same thing and contrary to what we learned in Sunday school and sometimes kept as an image into our adult life, the kingdom of God is not a place. It, neither is it an earthly kingdom where a Messiah figure sits in a bejeweled castle reigning over humans puttering around on a planet Earth that's been cleansed. The kingdom of God is God's rule. His kingdom is his eminent presence, his reign, his dominion. And that reign and rule and dominion takes place in the interior of each of us. 
So the kingdom of God is at hand, it is available, it is here, and it's taken by violence, as Jesus says. And it isn't one skirmish, it is a life of, of aggressive spiritual warfare. That's how it's, so it's not outside of us. Now, would we hear John the Baptist say, look at you and say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Or Jesus say, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. How do we respond? We got two choices. Whoa, this guy is crazy and we're out of here. And off we go into discontinued disconnectedness from God or we are compelled to respond by turning towards God. That turning towards God is repentance. Turning away, rejecting it, thinking, thinking I gotta go home and think about it. I know I've got some land I just bought, I gotta go deal with that. Whatever it is that we use as an excuse to sidestep out of that is turning away from God. So repentance is what we're called to, but remember, repentance is not to be confused with remorse or guilt. Like, I feel sorry. Have you ever said, I'm sorry? There's a guilty feeling at remorse. Those, those feelings are actually good, but that isn't repentance at all. It's not fixing the guilt or remorse, adjusting ourselves so we don't feel guilty or remorseful anymore. It's certainly not that feeling sorry for what we've done wrong. Now, sorrow is a good thing. It's a good start. And we're going to see how sorrow and joy go together in repentance. Motives for repentance are also important to understand. We don't repent based on our feelings, at least not in the long run. Feelings are fleeting. Neither should it be fear. We're repenting because we fear the future. We're scared to death of what's going to happen. Again, not in the long run. Is that going to create repentance? So we don't really repent just because we fear the judgment. There's got to be more to why we repent. Because fear leaves us and is not, most of the time, and it's not a good motivator for the opposite of fear, which is love. Fleeing fear does not create a condition of love. The only motivation for repentance that's sustainable and uh, is to understand oneself. And for that, God acts first. He sends us help to see who we really are. And for that, we step into a place where we get humble. We see who we really are and it creates a condition of humility. Humility is to believe and to feel that we ourselves are not self-sufficient. We're totally dependent on God. Now we need to come to that point and to come to that point that's what begins to motivate us to repent is humility. I think one of the great symbols of humility is right there. Humbled himself unto death even though he was God. Before Jesus, the cross was a tool of capital punishment. It was a symbol of utter defeat, great fear, hopelessness, suffering, cruelty, evil, um, violence, utter ongoing pain, and abandonment by God. And of course, you were a criminal. You were looked down upon by all of society. But the cross of Christ instead shows God's strength, his wisdom, power, and love for us. Because the cross of Christ changed the crucifix into a symbol of triumph. 
It was the vehicle over which death is triumphed and all of us are freed. Just as the, cro the cross is the height of God's love and extreme humility, this, the sign of his son, so also the greatest strength of man is to embrace his own weakness. As Paul says in Corinthians, my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I render glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me because in our weakness, I, I mean, the, he didn't keep because is me. It ends with and Christ rest upon me because in our weakness, we turn utterly to God and we ab abandon the ego and self-directed, hard-headed willfulness that always fails us. <laughs> okay, so let's take the term repentance. Let's look at repentance. The Greek term for repentance is metanoia. Metanoia. And so when you hear this repent, the Greek word they're using is metanoia, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Metanoia is being repentance means a change of direction, a change of heart, a change of mind. To repent is to change. Where and how? In the mind. Change of mind. I would do this, but no, I'm going to do this instead. I would go this direction, but no, I'm going to go this direction. I'm going to follow Christ. But wait a minute. It's way deeper than that. Because the word metanoia comes from two words, meta and noia. Metanoia means change, meta of mind. But the word is noia, which is a form of noose. It's the change of noose. Just like paranoia, it, para means beside oneself or out of your mind. And hypnoia, under the mind. Hypnosis comes from hypnoia, which is below the level of the perceptive nooser mind, lower, a lower level of function, a more basic uh, to the human being. Meta means beyond, or behind, or after. Beyond the news behind it what's behind our perceptions what is beyond them so getting beyond getting out of moving on moving past do not remain uh, in on to better change what is and in the following and in following Christ to seek higher so metanoia means to get out of the human fallen rut we're in and be in a state of metanoia, changing, getting beyond it, being freed from it, being outside of our normal human state of the, the fallen state that the noose is in. So to accept is to understand. Metanoia means a change of mind, a reorientation, a fundamental transformation of outlook. Think of that. You're going to transform your outlook if you are living a life of repentance. You're going to be reoriented in your everything, your motives, your will, your reactions. Even instinctually, you will be rewired Godward. You will find a new vision of the world, a new way of looking at yourself, and a new way of loving others and God. So Jesus, when he says repent, doesn't mean improve yourself or become a good person, as people use the term. Instead, you're a new creation. You've really reoriented totally and become rewired, so to speak, in God, if we can use modern terminology for it. So if we follow him and we learn what he taught, he taught us to repent. He's teaching us basically to the fundamental change to die, to cut off sin, and to separate ourselves from death itself. So again, re repentance means more 
uh, than regret. It isn't that. But it's to act on the realization that you're acting on something, that the realization has darkened our spiritual vision and separated us from God. But you're acting on it. That's what repentance is. That sin has reduced us to a fragmented life, to broken relationships, and a lack of freedom in our acts and thoughts and understanding because we're stuck in the condition of a darkened noose that has us dealing in a world of reacting to everything around us instead of doing what is true and what is holy and what is pure and what is good in all things. Sin basically brings fear and death is the out and death which is the outcome of sin. So, what is at stake if our repentance is not what God commanded us to do for not doing what God commanded for repentance to be actualized in us. Remember, repentance isn't just a particular act of contrition, as important as they are. Like, I'm going to do 30 push-ups because I sinned, so there, there I, I've straightened myself out. Sometimes penance can seem that, like that disconnected. But repentance is an attitude, a state of mind, an ongoing way of life, a freedom from slavery. Repentance always includes faith, a faith that grows. And sometimes it can even grow and take a miraculous, there'll be a miraculous moment in us that happens that propels us into the faith. Some little thing often, but miraculous nonetheless. Being in repentance realizes it's the willingness to see the utter mess we've made of our lives and the mess we've made with others' lives and the way we've messed with people in moments of selfishness or self-justification. Being in repentance has us seeing these things clearly because we stepped out of ourselves, beyond ourselves. We get behind what's really pushing the buttons in us. Then repentance is a turning away from even little or big, big, big sins, even little sins. And repentance moves us to confess and to peel open the wounds of our own sin and feel contrition about it. That is why I encourage everyone to examine their day and bear their hearts to God at night as they prepare for sleep, begging his forgiveness and healing. So God initiates, oh, I, I, mean, I just skipped something I wanted to cover. What is at stake? I talked about. But now what about the quality of repentance? What is repentance like for us? Well, first of all, the, probably the primary quality is repentance produces fruit, just like a plant. If a plant is healthy, it's producing fruit. Your repent, repentance will produce a fruit if it's not fleeting or fluttering. You had a moment where you were repentant, but you slipped back into hard-heartedness, unwillingness to examine who you are, unwillingness to allow yourself to live in a state of humility in relationship to God and love with other people, above all else, preferring that their happiness over your own. The quality of repentance Think of things like, is it constant? Are you constantly feeling the metanoia that you should be living? Is it consistent, not bouncing around all over the place? And do you sustain it 
for the duration of your life. Those are qualities of how repentance works and what makes it change us. If not, repentance is merely a dangerous signal, your moment of feeling you need to repent. John Chrysostom said, it is necessary to repent, not merely for a day or two, but throughout one's whole life. It's a continuation of what Christ called us to. He called us to a life when he steps out of the desert, his fasting and his confrontation with the evil one. And he comes upon people and his message is repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He is conquering death for us. Now all we have to do is repent and, and receive it. Our action in response to his incarnation to take away the sins of the world is for us to give them over through repenting. Because otherwise we have the right, the freedom, and the tainted will to hold on to crap a whole bunch of fallen crap. He takes away what we give over to him. Well, yeah. What did you mean earlier by violent? It's, violent. it's taken by violence, yeah. struggle. Okay. We have to fight our, 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 the nature that would want us to drift along. Life is not a la la la, let me be happy. Oops, it's rough over there. I'm gonna go over here where I'm happy. I'm gonna make go where it's easy. I'm gonna go where it's, you know. That isn't people, it's the interior warfare. It isn't about people. We are to be at peace and bring help and healing and peace and love to all people. The violence is in ourself. It's aggressiveness. Now, what the Greek word is, I don't know, and I don't know how tainted our English word violence is because we all abhor violence in, in our current times, but there's a place for a, that aggressive spiritual warfare. And especially when we're talking about repentance, that's how we remain constant, consistent, sustainable as we're doing battle we realize that there's an enemy to root out and it's a lifetime of warfare. And so in that, the purification happens? In that, absolutely, because repentance, we could say, is that first step of reaching reunion with God, which we must do continuously for our entire lifetime, which is purification, purification, purification. I heard one priest in a chat room say it in a way I really liked it, because. You know, sometimes people want to know, well, what does baptism do and why do we do what we do after baptism? And it's too easy to have to talk too much and feel like you've gone in circles explaining how it works. And if, if baptism washes away sin, why is, uh, why is it I turn around and sin 30 days later? I, la I lasted for 30 days and then I finally sin. I mean, I'm being a little facetious there, but he said it beautifully. He said this. He said, baptism washes away all of the ancestral sin so that being born subject to ancestral, ancestral sin, we're now cleansed of that. Now we have to sustain a spiritual life, work on purification, go to confession, have communion. Com confession is like a second baptism. It's a re-upping of the cleansing of the heart. So we're staying clean and sustaining ourselves in the, ba in the same grace that baptism gave us when we were first baptized. So we take in the body and blood of Christ, we confess, we take in what is holy, and we confess our, our fallings, our stumblings, our sins. That's the work, okay? The question was a clarification on my term about earlier when I said the kingdom of heaven is taken by violence, which Christ tells us. Okay. So consistency, which I just spoke about, is, is what makes as much as possible, makes us aware of God's beauty, love, and kindness 
rather than focusing on God's divine wrath, the wrath of judgment. We see beauty, love, kindness, and that that beauty, love, and kindness in illuminating experience makes us realize the chasm that separates us from his magnificent grace. The more we are filled and experience God's uh, beauty, his love, his radiance, his kindness, the more we see just how big a chasm is there and how dark the fallen world is. So God initiates repentance in us by his Holy Spirit. He begins with us. For some, some of you here, it was, do I go in that bookstore or not? That was God beckoning, giving you the opportunity to respond to a call. He does the first work and continues after the initial opportunity with his Holy Spirit. He invites us in, opens his arms to his change, just as Jesus and John the forerunner did. He invites us in. But this invitation requires our acceptance. So the question is then, how do we respond? How do we accept his invitation to repentance? Well, first we become aware that the world does not rotate around us and doesn't fulfill our every desire and aspiration. It's, the world isn't here for us to experience bliss in this world. We got to recognize that immediately. And we recognize that our sin separates from God and others and that we yearn instead for love. To accept, we must desire to confess the sins, to repent, to break free from our thoughts, especially the loges moi, and they will assault us even more actively if we're trying to pursue cleansing and being free from them. We stop acting on our own thoughts, stop acting on all of them, because the battleground is in the mind. Our response to uh, to the invitation of repentance is pretty simple. We turn our attention to Christ. We thank him. We connect with him in praise. We stand in awe. We feel our hearts wanting to love him, not knowing how to love him, but we yearn to experience God's love. Recognizing that all love has rooted in God and that if it is love, it, and is pure, we will feel God's presence in that love. And most importantly, we turn away from the gravity well, the black hole, the pull of our thoughts that are pulling us away back into being self-centered, wanting to do something for me, separate, self-willed. That is the fall. It's like falling into a gravity well, that we were born in the midst of a fall into a gravity well of self-centeredness and desire. So repentance is a constant struggle to respond to that call of the Holy Spirit. One of the things people feel is contrition for their lives, contrition for the things they've done. And contrition is more than just a feeling. It's a spiritual warfare against de de demonic and, and the darkness of, the, of what we call the world in a battle to give ourselves to God. If it was a one-time deal, this contrition, I'm sorry, forgive me, God, save me, psh, baptize, boom, done, saved. If it was more, if it was just that, then sure, the feeling, the emotion is there when you feel it. You're gonna feel it in that moment where you kind of give yourself over to, to um, that um, confession. But we have to move beyond those initial feelings and thinking of it as a feeling. Am I feeling it? We get beyond it. We have to act responsibly with consistency and sustainability, both to God and to other people. We do it because it's what will um, bring us into a repentant relationship with God. Okay. So that's a description of, of repentance, but now let's talk about practical ways for that to actually happen. 
because even though I described what you must do and feel, you don't just go, okay, I'm going to be contrite. You know, it doesn't work quite like that. Things, we've got to do something to, to have it happen. And the church has given us a way of life the, from the apostles onward in the teaching. And remember when I said before the class started that um, lives of saints embody for us what it means to be a whole hum, divine human being? Christ, that's what he did. He showed them what wholeness was. And they got to see what causes their separation and they got to be enlightened by the down outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost and they became a full radiant apostles of what this good news and what this path was. So let's talk about ways it happens and things you must do to live a life of repentance. Number one is daily prayer. And we're not talking about just or even mainly in your own words. Not, we're not talking about your own word prayer. Though you should pray those, but that isn't repentant. Too much, relying too much on your own words and thoughts will, will be easily manipulated to avoid what you really need to face. Because you... The inner you, the selfish you, the self-centered you will avoid the really hard things, even when you're contrite. So learn the 50th Psalm. Say it often. Say it every day. It's in your prayer book. It's a phenomenal expression, divinely connected in full repentance before God of the holy psalmist, King David. We pray a prayer of repentance that the prophet David did and was canonized for it, and his prayer is holy scripture to us. Our prayer book, your daily prayer book, if you don't have a daily prayer book, see me about it. Let me show you where to get it. Begin the practice of daily prayers. The prayer book teaches us how to pray. We pray the prayers so that we can learn to pray. There's the Jesus prayer. There's prayers before communion. We'll actually talk more about prayer in, an act, in one of those after Sunday classes that I keep trying to do, but we get interrupted by Sunday school and other emergencies. This Sunday, I'm bound to determine to do an after liturgy, after agape meal, get back together and do one of these Christian practices. Okay, we will do this starting this Sunday again. The second thing besides daily prayer, the second practice for you that's, that will be a way to live repentance is, you ready for it? Bite your tongue. Jesus said the penalty for calling your brother a fool was the hell of fire. And your brother includes people who can't hear you, like politicians on TV. Do like I do, beg forgiveness for all the ways that those triggers make me think of people as fools. It's not the harm to them that's at stake as much as it is the surging, disoriented pride that's in your own heart when you're judging the actions of others and judging, condemning, cursing, disregarding, debasing people. It's a very hard thing to do, but it's, the, it's number two on the list. Prayer first, bite your tongue second. Then, of course, fasting according to the church, which is restricting food, but it's also declining favorites for a time in a, as a way of strengthening willpower muscle to be ready when it's needed to handle bigger temptations. Learn how to just say no to the constant satiating of our treats and appetites and things like that. And I say this because it exer you, you exercise yourself to godliness by simple things like fasting, 
just like an athlete doesn't lift weights so that he can lift weights, so that he can lift more weights, so that he can lift more weights, he's getting his healthy muscles ready for the contest so he can run the race or whatever situation he's in where he meets it. So turn down a donut today and tomorrow you might be able to resist calling the driver in front of you an idiot. Learn to exert your willpower. The church fast is another thing. We'll talk more about the church fast. But do follow the first church fast and do separate yourself from, you can't do just the church fast and then as one of the elders said, I'm gonna, I interrupted myself there. He said, what good does it do to fast from food when you chew on your brother? It's worthless. And our brother is even everyone who has the opportunity to come to know God. So mind your thoughts and don't believe everything you think. Just because you think it doesn't make it right or true. So don't editorialize about people. Don't judge others. All those things are obvious. Don't project motives. If something happens that's uncomfortable or disorienting, don't judge, don't editorialize, don't project. Nearly all sins begin with thinking about the sin. As a matter of fact, Jesus said that to commit adultery in the imagination is the equivalent of committing it in fact. So turn your attention away from your thoughts. That's all still part of number four, I think we're on. Yeah, mind your own thoughts. Be aware of your thoughts, your motives, your deeds. And don't do it in a self-critical, brutal guilt trip way, but in the light of Jesus. Because Paul counsels us to think about things that are true and lovely and gracious, excellent, praiseworthy. So instead of a sleazy soap opera, go watch something heartwarming and light, something that lifts you up, something that's beautiful, something that's true. Look for that everywhere. Don't even be in a situation where you've got to discern and filter and think about crap in the world. Okay, number five, the fifth way to, to um, examine, uh, to live in repentance is to examine oneself in the light of the gospel. Not in light of politics or your political leanings or what your friends think or what the world says. To do this, you need to know God's will. You need to know what God's will is for you and what the gospel says. So read the scriptures every day. Read just the daily reading. Read the daily reading and a little commentary. If you have phones, and I see everybody here mostly has a smartphone and they're, they're connected to it, download the app Katena because it has the commentary of the fathers. Look up the daily reading on uh, the OCA website. If you don't have the calendar, if you have a calendar, it's right there printed in front of you every day. Look up in Katena, read it, pray about it, and then after you connect with what's being said, then hit the little button and see, oh, this is what John Chrysostom said. Oh, this is what Irenaeus said. Oh, this is what... Use those little tools to enlighten you about what is God teaching us in his gospel. That's examining oneself in light of the gospel. There's other ways. There's lots of other tools but just make sure we get a chance to do it. Re but we need to read the interpretation of the Holy Fathers, not just everybody. Not, no matter what Pastor Larry says that's good, great. But read scripture in the light of the Fathers. Number six is to examine yourself in light of relationships. So what would we do? We stop thoughts from being what the, they're the wrong kind. We examine who we are and what's going on in life and what we understand in God's will in light of scriptures. Then we examine ourselves in light of our relationships. 
What's broken in the relationships you have? Who do you have broken relationships with? Or who do you continually judge? Or who do you continually critique? They ought to be doing this, they ought to be doing that. In your own mind, who do you ignore or who are you responding to in Christ's call when he says, love the neighbor? Examine that. And when the prodigal son came to himself in the gospel parable, he did so in relationship to his father. He said, I will rise, go to my father, and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and earth before you. So we repent in communion with others in the church. That's where this happens, because it is in relationship with others that the truth of who we are and what we need to do to adjust ourselves to the love of God is actualized. So repentance makes us accountable to something and to someone other than ourselves. We can't self-judge, self-critique, self. We have to do it in relationships. Now, certainly our spouses are first on the list, our children, our co-workers, and those in charge, mostly God, those in charge in the church, those who are, are your brothers in the faith, etc. There is a communion that takes place in all of that. So having examined yourself, number seven, is to come to confession at least once a month. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to give you a little more in confession here. We will have a class on it, but this is really important. Frequent confession is really important. And when you become, um, when you're baptized and, and are living a sacramental life, this becomes a more formal process. But coming and seeking to confess your uh, heart, your thoughts, confession of thoughts, to me even before you're baptized, because as a spiritual father, that's my role to help you with the things you're uncovering as you examine yourself. But come to confession if you're an Orthodox Christian at least once a month. In our examination, we don't fear sin with psychological fear of guilt or getting a bad self-image or depression. And we don't try to measure our moral improvement or perfection. Instead of beating ourselves up because we could become aware of all the stuff that we've got wrong, we become aware of our sins or the things I'm going to call them the parts of life that have wired us to be unable to just drop things once we recognize that it's there. Struggle, to, again, this is fighting uh, for the kingdom of God with violence. We have to do violence against ourselves because some of these sins are rooted in a rewiring that is addiction. And everything can take a form of addiction, from food to behavior to the way we want comfort. And anything like that can become an addictive rewiring to our person, but we don't want to beat ourselves up over it. The church, we remember that in the church, our sin is a starting point for repentance, the starting point for us to experience the miracle of salvation. It's the, the, our sin and all of these issues are a launching point into the journey in the church. We have to struggle to remember that even our most virtuous acts in reality of our human existence is still falling short. We think we really did good. And there's a higher perspective about when we think we're doing good. So we, won't, we need to get to the point where we're not, we have no pride in that. And we get into a point where there's a Mm -hmm. What is felt is in confession is a joy producing sorrow. That's how, I don't know what the words are in Greek, but that is the sense of things. What is joy producing sorrow? Initially, we fear looking squarely at our sins lest we get overwhelmed, but the reverse turns out to be true. The more we see the depth of our sin, the more we realize the height of God's love. So the constant companion of repentance is gratitude like the women, woman who washed Jesus' feet with her tears. We are forgiven much and discover endless love when we 
truly repent at a deep level. Seeing our sin becomes strangely a sorrow, but also a joy that we know God receives and loves us. Feel the sorrow of the condition, yet the joy of how we're overwhelmingly accepted in spite of it and how it does not thwart the, the way God embraces us. That joy produces, that joy producing sorrow leads us to not just avoid sins, but even better, more importantly, it helps us start acquiring the fruits of the Holy Spirit. And now this is true work of repentance and one that is initiated, motivated, and accomplished by God. We begin as this process happens, as we're cleansed, we have this acquisition of the Spirit of God. Stopping sin is the first act. Then the purification of the inner man is the goal. So as you were asking, it is purification that we're experiencing when this happens. And you'll read many things, and I know it's hard to embrace at first, that repentance comes with tears. And weeping is really good when it is the recognition of our state in humility and the joy of knowing how much we're loved. Okay, number eight. That was seven. Confession. Confessing our sin. Number eight in what does it mean to live in repentance? Yes, remember the one, bite your tongue? Well, here's another one. Do not look at the sins of others. Instead, practice humility. And yes, practice makes perfect. Humility is not the same thing as resisting the urge to show off. Oh. It's not, you know, people are patting you on the back and you're going, it's okay, I, I just, you know, I, I didn't really do that good. The resisting the, st the, the taking of accolades or showing off or doing it, that's not humility. It's not humble to deny you have gifts or talents. That, that would be called lying. You shouldn't lie either. If you have a gift or you have a talent or you've been blessed, denying it isn't humility. But humility is remembering that you have a beam in your eye, just as Christ talked about. Oh, it doesn't matter what gifts I have. It doesn't matter what talents I have. It doesn't matter what I think of myself or what I've done. I got, I'm messed up in the light of God. I'm not talking psychoanalysis. I'm not talking about what society says. I'm talking about the truth of the gospel of Christ. In every situation, we need to remember what God knows about you and how much you have been forgiven. He already sees all of it. You might think you can fool people, but no matter how charming you appear, spiritually, you have spinach in your teeth, okay? And that's why Paul says, account ourselves as chief of sinners. I believe, O Lord, and I confess that thou art truly, right? We pray that every day. And what do we say? I am the what? You hear it every Sunday. I'm chief among sinners or first among sinners. Say it like you mean it and mean it when you say it. Most important thing you can do is stop looking at the sins of others and comparing yourself. It's irrelevant. Every one of them have to come to that same realization and it doesn't have anything to do with you except create pride and comparison and judgment which start taking you out of a place of grace. Is that making sense? Do I, get, do I get a nod? I don't want an amen, but how about a nod? Okay. No, you shook your head no, you rascal. It was on your, you were leaning on your, and so it went like that. Okay. 
Be gracious towards the failing of others. It even says, overlooking the insults. Overlook insults people get, shoot your way. Be kind to those who misuse you. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute and say all manner of evil against you because that is the pinnacle of the Beatitudes when we've achieved all of this humility and you are blessed to over, when you overlook it, when you don't respond to it, when you instead respond in love. <clears throat> Be swift to admit when you're wrong. Ask others to forgive you and forgive them without asking. Don't ask them to recognize their problems so that you can forgive them. Just forgive them anyway. Forgive them no matter how, how mindless it might be what has happened, how little they understand. Forgive anyway. Okay, number nine. Oh good, I might make it in one hour. We'll see. Number nine. <clears throat> if you're going to live a life of repentance, you come to church services. Divine liturgy on Sunday, Saturday evening, Vespers. Vespers is the foundation to understand the incarnation. <clears throat> Vespers has a focus on sat great Vespers on Saturday evening is the Help, it, it describes in all of the Lord I have cried verses and all of the components, it's describing the mystery of the incarnation of Christ, his suffering as our savior and his glorious resurrection and how we are saved. It actually theologically uh, impacts us and, I, and it impacts us in an inner way. It's not a scholastic work. It's meant to be prayed and internalized. Divine Liturgy on Sunday and feast days, <clears throat> well, at least the vigil on the evening of the feast day if you have, you're at work. And yep, vigils are hard because you got to go to work the next day. So you miss the celebration of the feast day because you got to be at work. And then you're too tired to come on the night before because you got to go to work. Don't do that to yourselves. Yes, you're tired. But we need to withdraw and decompress from that work, but not forget God in doing so. It's important if we're gonna live repentance to be obedient to the church calendar and to be obedient to something other than our own will. Accept what the church has given us as a template for how to live a consistent, sustainable life of repentance. Everything centers around the church services. The teaching, the theology, the transformation, repentance itself takes place in the arena of the, the church itself. Our will is a mechanism that we use to change, but it is broken. So we need something outside of our will that is true and therapeutic and holy. That's what the divine services give us, a structure in which we, our own will is not going to have its way with us all the time. So come, whether you feel like it or not. I'll have to say that sometimes people who are feeling, quote, sick, are not feeling well so they don't come, they just need to rest. That's understandable if, if their, their sickness is debilitating. But if life's a struggle or you're stressed, or you're the, it's not going to get better by skipping what is divine, holy, true, and filling us from the inside with grace. So we come whether we feel like it or not, and then we work on making ourselves attentive to pray with the heart and mind. Every feast opens to us a way to participate in the thing that is being celebrated. It's not a history. It's not just remembering something before, it brings us into the reality of that. And these feasts especially, we need to enter into the reality of what the major feasts really are. We need to feel its work in us and our participation in it in a present way. <clears throat> That's what the feasts do. Number 10, every day remember 
your own death, your own mortality. Not in a sick psychological way, but in terms of your life, your dependence on the Savior, your faith, your sins, your persistent passions, remembrance of death, that right around the corner, this will be taken from you and you will have no more chance to repent. Live with a memory of death. My favorite, one of my favorite photos of a monastery that I saw really early on, and it was used in the death to the world zines, but I saw a monk had it and they were gonna use it in a publication, was a picture of a tomb, not a tomb-like opening, but it was big and arched. And there was an iron grate across it. And on the back wall, as you peered in, there were skulls stacked against the back wall, rows and rows and rows of skulls all the way up the wall. And you could see that it was deep and there were many bones and skulls in there. And the monk here was smiling and pointing to a sign, older monk. And the sign said, we were once like you. You will soon be like us. Great picture. Because that's why I'm always using the term worm food when I'm preaching. Consider your mortality. 11, read the lives of the saints to find examples of repentance that move you. Like St. Moses the Black or even St. Paul, St. Peter, St. Mary. Mary Magdalene, read their lives. Find how repentance, how they were transformed into the saints they are. And number 12, never blame others for your situation. Every struggle is a step bringing you closer to God. Okay, so remember that our faith is bound up in this repentance we're doing. And all of these steps, for us to do them, we have to have faith in Christ. We have to take that, those first steps of faith to do these things, to begin living in repentance. St. Paul in Ephesians wrote this, God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with us, with which he has loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace, you've been saved. And he raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the age to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Remember how you read scripture, you read it over, read it over. I just read this over and over oh, for the last, I've read this over and over for many times and I just saw something I'm gonna share with you. For by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourself. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself. We always think that grace isn't our own, but comes from God when we read that. And I'm going to go now and look, but let me share this with you. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourself. In other words, the faith you even have doesn't come from you. We're saved by grace through faith, but the gr faith isn't from us. That came from God. Most Western interpretations are about the act of grace, saving us, if we have faith. We gotta own faith, we gotta, we're the creator of our own faith, etc. but God saves us because he's the creator of salvation through grace. Do you see the subtle difference there? It's the faith that God gives us that allows us to move through these, these lessons of salvation, these methods of salvation, so that we can be fulfilled. So true faith and repentance are actually lived together. Faith isn't ideas. Faith is, it's, 
its actions and a way of continual being. It's not ideas. It's actions and a way of being. It, it moves in us by God. Demons believe, said St. James, but they don't rely on God. We rely on God and God gives us faith so that we can be saved. The model for this, of course, is in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, you see grace. You see people in faith. You see it. The model's also in the lives of the saints. Now, we need knowledge, yes, but knowledge doesn't save. It's the reliance on God that brings the growth in faith that makes repentance possible. So lean on God. Our goal is to arrange the details of our life to let God unfold according to his will. And don't forget, struggles, inconveniences, obstacles, stubbornness, sickness, all of these things, thunderstorms come, these things can be for our salvation. So we need to trust in God when they come, when all these struggles come. Trust in God. Let him reveal himself, his faith, and live a life of repentance. That faith and repentance go together. They live together so that beautiful deeds will emanate from us. We will bear fruit to the kingdom of God, the end. <laughs>